Hello everyone, welcome to week two of Issues and Trends in Health Systems. This week we're focused on health care costs. And we're just going to talk about the basics of health care costs. So uh, just try to, when you read the material for this, we just try to get a general understanding of uh, what's driving health care costs and uh, you know how much are we spending on health care throughout the nation and uh, get some general idea of what uh, what changes need to happen in order to reduce costs. So we're going to talk briefly about the three pillars of health policy, health systems, uh, where are healthcare dollars going, costs of medical technology, and where do we rank compared to other countries with regards to costs and our return on investment as a country actually. So uh, the main three pillars of health policy, if you're getting a health policy degree in a public health school, uh, you will be told that access, cost, and quality are the, basically the fundamental pillars of health policy. So for almost any health policy issue you're thinking about, there are going to be access issues, cost issues, and quality issues. And these three concepts are often intertwined, uh, interacting in a variety of different ways. Uh, so if you increase access to uh, some particular drug, uh, you may uh, be able to reduce costs uh, because you're, you've increased the volume or the number of people that can actually uh, get it and pay for it. Um, of course, you have to figure out who's going to pay for it, so that's a cost issue, on whether it's covered or not. Uh, and then, of course, uh, are people getting the medication they need? So if you're increasing access, are you increasing access in a way that makes sense so that people are actually getting something that's valuable for them or are they just getting uh, some medication that actually is not helping them in any way and so it's actually not improving the quality of care they're receiving and that's a really basic example but uh, these three f fundamental concepts operate uh, and impact almost every healthcare decision so when we look at where the money is going in healthcare, uh, this is a typical graph you see uh, that, that illustrates uh, what we're spending nationally on healthcare. And uh, you can see the big categories are hospital care and physician clinical services. So we're spending most of our money on the provider side. Uh, more than half of our money is spent uh, on providers. Now what's embedded in this is that the money is not going just to doctors, right? So, the or just to the providers in the hospital. The money is also going to all of the technology that they have to purchase. So, you're paying to access the facilities too. So, so this is all those costs embedded into one. Um, and so, so just realize this is not just what we're paying individuals. This is what we're paying for the services that people provide and also all of the goods involved. So medical technology is integrated into uh, these costs. For example, diagnostic tests that you're uh, paying for when you're at the hospital or in a clinic environment. Uh, the next uh, largest category would be prescription drugs. Prescription drugs stay at around 10%. They go up and down occasionally each year. Uh, but we tend to spend around that much money and other developed countries spend a similar amount of money on drugs. Now we, uh, sorry, a similar percentage of their budget on drugs. We spend more money, uh, as I'll point out in a second, uh, on everything uh, than most countries. And we definitely spend more money on drugs. We actually pay higher prices for our drugs than other countries do. And you can see there are a variety of other costs. Uh, any, you know, program administration, um, investment in healthcare uh, in order to create new technologies, build new hospitals and so on. Uh, nursing home care, home health care is only at 3% now but it's rapidly growing. It's one of the fastest growing uh, ex sources of expenditures uh, for our health care system. And the reason why of course is because baby boomers are getting older and we want more of them to stay at home and not go into nursing homes and one way to do that is to provide them with home health care so uh, you're going to see that that line of business growing over time and you're going to uh, see more ex money being spent 
uh, in every state and by the federal government on home health care because we think that that's a cheaper way and in most cases it is a cheaper way to take care of patients and uh, you can do that at a high quality level and allow people to uh, uh, live in an environment that uh, is better for them. So the cost of medical technology. Medical technology, as your reading points out, is a big driver of health care costs. It's probably the biggest driver of health care costs. And so what does that mean? Medical technology is a really broad term. It's referring to uh, new drugs, new devices, new tests, uh, uh, new ways of uh, administering drugs, perhaps, or uh, new types of uh, medical products or what's called durable medical equipment. So anything from your regular crutches improving in some way to really fancy wheelchairs. So all of this stuff that we use in healthcare, all these tools that people come to the healthcare system for, uh, cost money. And there are a, a huge amount of manufacturers who are trying to always trying to meet some new need in healthcare or trying to improve upon a product they already have in order to make more money. So when we talk about the cost of health care going up, we also have to remember that for some industries that's actually a good thing because that means their bottom line is increasing. They're getting more revenue in. So uh, this is how uh, health care dollars stimulate the economy. So remember there are, are thousands of people, millions of people really, employed by the health care industry in this country. So when when costs are going up and when we're spending more on health care uh, those industries are actually being filled and they're being and they're growing and uh, a number of uh, in, in different regions of the country right there are some regions that have more of these kind of businesses than others so although it's a big driver and we would like to get costs down we also have to remember uh, that there are some benefits for the economy and uh, if we're actually producing technology that's valuable and actually helping improve people's lives, then uh, that would be a good way to spend our money, right? So healthcare costs increasing are not always bad, uh, but you have to figure out why are they increasing and are we getting anything for it? And as, as we'll point out in a second, we're not necessarily getting uh, the return on investment at least collectively uh, that we want from individually. People may be getting great return on investment. So where do we rank compared to other countries? Well, as you can see, we're way ahead of uh, everyone else. We are basically in our own category when it comes to the amount of money we spend on health care. So, so we fork out a lot of money as a country, and this means our insurers, uh, individuals, uh, um, employers, they all fork out a lot of money on health care, mainly trying to get people the best technology uh, they can. So uh, the, the idea is that we are trying to, we want to be one of the healthiest countries in the world and we think it, that that's not going to be free of course and uh, we want to make sure we spend appropriately in order to uh, access that health care. Well it also turns out that we spend a lot of money towards the end of life, right? So many of you may have seen um, some of the various series that magazines have been doing on end-of-life care. For example, Money Magazine has been running a series on end-of-life care and just discussing something that's well known in health policy circles that we we have we spend an increasing amount of money on health care as we age, right? And during the last six months of life, most people spend more on health care uh, than they spent in the last probably five to ten years before that because people are doing everything they can to stay alive. Um, so the, the question is whether or not we can actually do a better job preparing for end-of-life care, figuring out what we want, what we don't want early, uh, while we're healthy, while we can discuss these issues with our families, so we don't essentially break the bank or run down all our life savings uh, or money that we may have wanted to use for some other purpose within our families. Uh, now we're spending just on uh, health care. So just making sure that we actually prepare well for end-of-life care so that we won't end up forking out so much money uh, at the end of life when uh, the money really is not, uh, in some cases, uh, being spent well. So uh, th these expenditures at the end of life often are not as valuable for uh, people uh, um, uh, 
you know, that we not as valuable as we think they would be. Uh, so that's something we have to work on as a country. It's really a cultural issue uh, with regards to our perception of uh, end of life uh, concerns and how we die and so on. But that is actually a strong uh, factor with regards to when we're spending the money. And of course, we use a lot of technology at the end of life when we're trying to keep ourselves alive uh, during the last few months of life. Now, what's our return on investment? Well, if you look down at the bottom of this uh, graph, you'll see that the United States is, uh, uh, you know, not in the middle of the pack, but sort of on the, uh, in the lower half when it comes to uh, life, life expectancy on this chart. Well, actually, no, I'll say uh, we're, we're in the, uh, I'd say we're, we're more, we're more in the middle when it comes to women and probably on the lower half uh, when it comes to uh, males, births, and uh, life expectancy. So so we're doing okay. Uh, we're not uh, terrible, that's for sure. And we're much better than uh, a developing country. Uh, but we're not competing with other developed countries as well as we should. For example, if you look at uh, France, France is living much longer than we are. Uh, Japan, of course, is uh, doing a much better job than we are, or Switzerland, Australia, and so on. So countries we like to compare ourselves with, uh, the UK, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not really in the running uh, for when it comes to life expectancy uh, for the top spots. So we can improve. Uh, we're, our life expectancy has definitely been increasing over time. Um, you may ask, well, does it really matter if we're living, you know, four years more uh, than, or you know, than we currently do. Is that really useful? Uh, does that matter? And you know, hey, my grandmother died at 95, so she lived way beyond this. And are these numbers really uh, providing a true picture of what goes on in families? Well, there are clearly people who live much longer than any of these numbers, um, and despite many challenges they have in life. Uh, so people definitely are not defined by these uh, general numbers for populations, but it does give you a sense of how we perform um, as a nation and uh, whether or not they're probably, uh, w whether or not we are performing as well as our peers in other nations, especially in nations that are extremely diverse because obviously in this country we have an extremely diverse population so we have more complicated health care concerns than countries that are more homogenous where people have similar cultures and uh, uh, you know um, behaviors and so on and uh, they're able to they don't face the challenges of trying to interact with so many different types of people and communicate information to so many different types of people which makes healthcare in America uh, so much more challenging than some other more homogenous countries like Japan is much more homogenous so uh, people can communicate information faster they're more likely to listen to one another and so on it can be an easier transaction uh, between the public health system and um, the general public versus in the U.S. where people may question the system for a variety of reasons, uh, and many of which have to do with differences among our, uh, the, our among people in our population. So the return on investment is not as good as we would like for it to be when it comes to life expectancy. If you look at mortality from from something like strokes, you'll see that again we're definitely not uh, uh, performing. Uh, um, uh, uh, the best, but we are performing much better uh, than our peers. So there are definitely, and this is some older data, this is from 97 as you can see, uh, there are definitely uh, times when we are doing better than our peers and there are definitely times when we're doing worse than our peers. So it, it really depends on what you're looking at. If you look at big things like life expectancy and infant mortality rate, we're not doing as well, but if you focus on certain conditions, uh, in this case uh, essentially strokes, uh, we may actually be doing uh, quite well compared to our competition and actually doing better than them. As you can see, we're doing better than most people, it's just Canada is edging us out a little bit. So in this graph, the lower numbers uh, make uh, mean that you're doing a better job. So uh, in that case, we're getting good return on investment, so that's good to see. 
All right, now what is the ACA doing with regards to uh, costs? What, is it lowering the costs or not? And throughout the course, when I talk about ACA, I'm talking about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act uh, that was passed in 2010 after lots of debate by Congress and the President and the general public and really strong vitriolic debates uh, that occurred in 2009 and 2010. Uh, the uh, law plus some amendments passed uh, in 2010 and the law is being implemented now and uh, the biggest uh, changes will occur in 2014 as we'll discuss throughout the course when uh, there's going to be a substantial increase in the number of uh, people who are becoming insured who are now currently uninsured so those major changes will happen in 2014 but there are a number of other changes that are already occurring and ha and occurred immediately after the law uh, was passed so we're already dealing with the implementation of the, the ACA uh, and we'll be dealing with it more moving forward in the future now does the ACA lower costs at all and you'll see lots of writings about this you know we have this 900 uh, page piece of legislation that uh, really doesn't make much of a dent in health care costs and in fact it uh, costs a lot of money itself right because uh, so much money is being spent to insure people but we think that uh, that insuring people will in the long run lead to lower costs and so Many of the changes in the ACA are focused on trying to prevent future costs and not lowering costs right away. So uh, the legislation will have to uh, be implemented fully and will have to basically monitor changes in costs over time to figure out whether or not uh, it's actually having an impact or not. Uh, there can be other uh, factors in society that can impact the costs, impact healthcare costs. Sorry, uh, for example, uh, when the recession occurred, uh, healthcare costs uh, dipped because of, or, or the growth of healthcare costs dipped because the recession took place and people were using less healthcare. So there can be other factors uh, that can definitely lead to lower healthcare costs. That's not necessarily what we want to see. We don't want to see people accessing less health care simply because they don't have money uh, but that's what's going to happen because health care is not free and so we see those kind of dips in recession but the answer to health care costs is not to create recession for the country so don't don't get those things mixed up now when we think about whether costs are being lower we always have to ask costs for whom right because as i said earlier lowering costs for consumers may be great for them but that's not great for healthcare manufacturers, right? People are creating new drugs and devices and so on. They want consumers to use more and consume more of this stuff, right? Uh, it's not good for health providers if patients are extremely healthy and they rarely come in to see the doctor. There was a, a case, there was actually a, a, a news story a few years ago in the New York Times that talked about a clinic, a diabetes clinic in New York that did such a great job at teaching their patients to manage their diabetes that the patients were coming in less and the business model of the clinic uh, suffered so that the clinic eventually went out of business. Now, what does that say to you? Well, it says, you know, providers, uh, if they do their job well, in some cases, actually will put themselves out of business. And most providers want to feed their kids like everyone else so they don't want to be out of business and they make business sorry they make money from uh, people being sick right so if you're not that sick that often then you're not going to help providers uh, bottom line that uh, that much so so we always have to think about well if we're going to reduce those costs what are going to be the uh, consequences of reducing costs so if we cut health care costs in half that would be a huge change in the healthcare industry and uh, a number of people will be unemployed as a result right so um, so we're in a, in a public health realm we really have to think about uh, what are the pros and cons of that now Frankly, people uh, don't engage in any monumental change like that rapidly so that healthcare costs would drop that quickly so we don't have to worry about that happening. Uh, but uh, over time, as society is starting to spend a more time on its health and, for example, eating more 
uh, more eating healthier foods, uh, we might see some drops in healthcare costs that we don't expect. We've already seen drops in uh, cancer treatment, for example, because less people have cancer because they're smoking less. So if we continue to drop there, then of course that cuts into jobs and less uh, chemotherapy meds are being sold and so on. So um, industries are affected by people becoming healthier just as they're affected by people being sick. So cost for whom is always a question. We're often focusing on reducing uh, government payouts. Remember that the government is an insurer. So uh, and that's state and federal governments. So they pay, they engage in providing uh, reimbursement for care themselves. They also finance the insurance of a huge amount of workers. Uh, so government actually pays for uh, most health care in the U.S. Um, by by financing health insurance, by sorry, by financing health care for workers, uh, and health insurance for workers, and also by uh, paying for health care uh, as an insurer for a number of citizens. So let's think about what government pays for. Government pays for Medicaid, essentially insurance for poor people, Medicare, insurance for seniors and uh, people with end stage renal disease and a few other conditions. Government at the state level uh, and federal level uh, pays for its own employees, and that's, as you know, is uh, that's a large, very large workforce, a well-paid workforce. Uh, all of them get insurance throughout the country, with very few exceptions. Uh, then government pays for who else, right? Military, right? So military and some vets. Not all vets get health care that's paid for by the government. Depending on uh, a vet's uh, level of service, exposure to combat, and so on, they're going to get more or less of their health care paid for uh, by the federal government, and they're going to be able to access the VA and uh, get certain levels of their care paid for. So that's a, a millions of people that uh, the federal government somehow, federal or state government, sorry, somehow finance uh, their health care. Um, so. Uh, just think about all those people who are involved and who are benefiting from uh, government payouts. Um, and these are not entitlements. This is, you know, these, these are people who are working for the government uh, and they're getting you know, health insurance as a benefit. These are people who put money in uh, through Medicare. And as Medicaid is, would really be the only entitlement program in a true sense in that people are getting something uh, simply because they're poor. They didn't actually work to get it. But uh, many people on Medicaid are paying taxes so or, or paid taxes in the past. And so they have put money into the system. It's not as though everyone on Medicaid put no money into the system. In most cases, they're working poor people. So at some point, they put some money into the system too. So you could argue that, yes, they're getting entitlement, but they are paying some of the load themselves. Of course, most of the uh, load is being bared by people who have higher incomes. We as a, we as a country have agreed that it makes sense to provide uh, some level of health insurance to people who are poor. And so we collectively then pay for those individuals. So what does ACA do? Uh, there are efforts in the ACA and provisions in ACA focus on lowering Medicare expenditures. In particular, the uh, provisions are focused on lowering the payouts to uh, HMOs, managed care companies that uh, provide something called Medicare Advantage. This is essentially the managed care version of Medicare. Uh, what does that mean to those of you who have, who have not been exposed to those kind of terms before? Well, what that means is that Medicare can be provided uh, by uh, the federal government using what's called fee-for-service payment. So every time a doctor files a claim or a hospital files a claim uh, with Medicare, they pay out for every service. So just like the mechanic, anytime something happens, you pay out. Uh, so that's a fee-for-service model. Um, another model is a managed care model where Medicare, uh, and this being administered by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Medicare will pay out money to a managed care company uh, and they'll create a contract with those companies to provide care to a certain number of people, a certain number of seniors, in order, so those seniors will then go to uh, that managed care organization, let's just say it's um, 
uh, managed care organization being managed by uh, um, Edna. And so Edna will offer a managed care plan to the seniors. Uh, the government will have a contract with Edna to pay out a certain amount of money to them in order to take care of a certain amount of seniors. And Edna will then organize the care of those seniors. They'll figure out who the providers are, who you know, who the various doctors are who can offer care to them, all of the other health professionals that can offer care to them. And those seniors will then have to operate within the terms of that plan in order to get their care. All right. So what the government can do is then lower the amount they pay out in those contracts to the managed care companies. Because it turns out that the government actually spends more on those contracts per patient than it spends when it pays out on its own. So there are efforts away uh, uh, being taken place uh, to actually lower the cost that we pay for managed care, the managed care version of Medicare. Okay. All right. Feel free to ask questions uh, at any time by uh, on a discussion board or by email about any of these things that, that I say during these many lectures. Uh, there are also efforts in the Affordable Care Act to keep costs down by paying for preventive services. So insurers will now, as a result of the ACA, have to offer preventive services for free, essentially. Not all preventive services, but preventive services that are deemed to be evidence-based, that are approved uh, by a number of different government bodies. Uh, I won't get into all those right now. We'll probably talk about it more later in the course. Uh, but there are certain preventive services that the government is deeming uh, as uh, being evidence-based and being uh, deserving of uh, being being deserving of being free uh, to the public so preventive services that should be made free to the public because they are so effective and so good at reducing the likelihood that someone will have a chronic disease that we should get all of these preventive services out to people because they're going to reduce the cost of care and again they're going to reduce the cost for who for government right uh, and it will also reduce your costs in the long run in that case too and there will hopefully be uh, less people using uh, emergency rooms, we hope, uh, if they have insurance. It turns out that most of the people sitting in the emergency room have insurance. Uh, so uh, people use the emergency room because it's convenient. Uh, clinics are often open during the time that people work. Uh, so uh, healthcare providers really have to think about other options beyond emergency rooms uh, to provide care for people on a 24-hour basis or at least uh, after work hours, right? So it's just it just turns out that the service is being offered in an inconvenient way uh, and that people will would rather sit at home or and do work or really go in for work uh, during the regular work hours and then are looking for uh, their health care after 5:30 or after 5 o'clock when they get off of work, uh, but they're willing to to bear the pain or um, deal with their their flu or whatever problem they're having while they're at work because they want to earn money, right? They want to keep their livelihood going, and and then after that they want to seek care. So we don't provide uh, urgent care uh, on a massive scale in a convenient way. And so healthcare providers have got to do a better job at that. Uh, but we hope that since more people will have insurance by 2014, that they will go to clinics instead of going to the ER. And so we'll avoid some of the uh, uncompensated care that we have taking place at ERs and we'll avoid uh, just unnecessary use of the ER in general. Okay, so that's it for this week. Feel free again to ask any questions you have. Uh, that's just a mini lecture to give you some general idea of uh, the basics of health for the reading that you're going to be doing this week. All right. Thanks.